Amen. All right, if you'd open your Bible to two places, Jude, there's only one chapter, Jude, we're going to read in verse 17, and I want you to also grab James chapter 3, James chapter 3, thank you Brother Fannin for the opportunity and allowing me to overstay my welcome, uh, and I'm going to try to be respectful of the time, uh, so if you wouldn't mind, I'm not going to have you turn to a lot of places. I'm just going to do more quoting and reading. But in Jude, look at verse 17. It says, But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lust. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the spirit. I want to focus on that word sensual. That means carnal and fleshly. That's an arousing gratification of the senses or sensationalism, emotionalism as we know it. Yeah. And the title of my sermon tonight is Bapticostalism in light of the Bible. Bapticostalism, not Pentecostalism, Bapticostalism in light of the Bible. Go over it with your other finger to James chapter 3. I had you turn there. Look at verse 15. It says, if a, um, oh, I'm in the wrong place. Verse 15 it says, this wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. So we see that sensual is being used synonymously with the words devilish and earthly. Yeah. In the Pentecostal world, I'm not going to preach a lot about Pentecostalism because we already know what Pentecostalism is. But the problem is a lot of Baptist churches, especially in the South, and according to Pastor McMurtry, they've even moved their way up north, is we've taken on the charis characteristics of the charismatic movement and left aside being slain in the spirit and tongue talking. Yeah. But we've taken their worship experience and we called it the old time way. We called it old time religion. So what I want to do, and I promise you, my intention is not to make fun. I know many people in that movement. Some of them are my very best friends. My intention is not to say they're going to hell. Forget all that mess. I'm talking about their doctrine, and I want to look at Bapticostalism in light of the Bible. Because if you're like me, and you've been to some of these churches, it leaves a big question mark. It feels good, it sounds good, it looks good, but according to the Bible, is it good? The Bible says in 1 John 4, 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. So that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to try the spirits, whether they be of God. Pentecostalism started in the earliest, early 20th century. And it was energized by revivalism. You've heard that word before. That's the new buzzword now. And an expectation for the imminent return of Jesus Christ, the pre-trib rapture. So they wanted to bring these apostolic gifts back that were done uh, at Pentecost, which wasn't even the same tongues that they used. They used gibberish, and the tongues back then were languages. Yeah. But it was started in the 1900s by a guy named Charles Parham. Okay, What he did is he started teaching that speaking in tongues was the evidence of spirit baptism. And you'll know his protege, William Seymour, started the famous Azusa Street Revival back in Los Angeles in the early 1900s. Now, this guy was, uh, aside from the fact that he had all kinds of things wrong, believe it or not, Charles Parham broke with him over emotionalism. He said, that's way too emotional. You're getting way too carried away. And this guy was corrupt as they come. Let me read you a few things about Charles Parham. He was a notorious public sodomite. Yeah, he was a homosexual. Right. He was arrested for it. Wow. He, was, uh, he believed in annihilationism. So he didn't believe that he was going to burn forever. He believed as soon as you got there, you just burn up. He encouraged his followers to dress stylishly to encourage the attractiveness of the Christian life. What do you know in Pentecostal and now Bapticostal churches on this flashy blue suits and gator skin, top hats, canes, to try to draw more people in. Yeah. And guys, look, when I first came down here, it was, it, 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 there was a lot of, the, the invitation seemed to take over the whole service. The music was awesome. I'll be honest with you, it, it, it sounded better than us. You know, I, though I like hymns and that's my favorite, to the world, it appeals, it's attractive. But what they did is, the Baptist, in the name of old time religion, didn't go back to the first century to grab their doctrine. They didn't go back to the Baptists of the 1600s. They went back to the Azusa Street Revival and they grabbed their worship experience that those people were making their idol and they took it into the Baptist church and said, well, we'll be like them. We'll just leave off the tongue talking and we'll leave off the slain spirit. No, I don't want anything to do with being yeah. a Pentecostal. I'm a Baptist. Right. I'm an independent, yeah. fundamental, Bible-believing Baptist using a King James Bible. And I want to go back to the way Jesus said to do things. Yeah. Of course, he was a strong proponent of 
the eminent preacher of rapture, Zionism, dispensationalism. During his services, three of his members actually died in an exorcism. So talk about trying the spirits, whether they be of God. They got a spirit. They just didn't get the right one. He believed that the Holy Spirit communicated with him directly, so he had no need of doctrinal you know, authority in his life because this Holy, I guess the Holy Ghost just bypassed Scripture and went straight to, uh, to Charles Parham. But that's where we get this. This uh, Azusa Street Revival wanted to evangelize the world. Here's the thing. They didn't go out soul winning. You know what they did? They evangelized the worship experience. They took it to all corners of the earth. And if you go to Haiti today, if they're not practicing voodoo and they're not Roman Catholic, you know what they are? They're Pentecostal. So these churches have taken over the Pentecostal movement because, listen, it's basically a rock concert without the rock. You know, it's a lot of crying. It's a lot of emotionalism. And because it feels good, we think it's right. But that's not the case. I'll give you some keys and how to pinpoint and what the Bible says about the Pentecostal movement. Spontaneity, spontaneousness, randomness, where the preacher will get up there and say, I just want to wait on God. We just want to get under the spout where the glory runs out. Jake's shaking his head because he come out of a Pentecostal background. But the same wordage, the same terminology that tends to be very vague, you start to see in these Pentecostal churches, or these Baptist churches. You know, uh, quench not the spirit, brother, and they take that out of 1 Thessalonians 5.19. Quench not the spirit. If you walk in the flesh, you quench the spirit. Yeah. They forgot the next verse that says, despise not prophesying. Hey, don't despise preaching. And most of these services are taken over with singing, and there is no preaching. Right. If they would have read one more verse, they'd read why they're quenching the spirit in the first place. Yeah. The Bible says, preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Brother Jake, two-thirds of our ministry is reproving and rebuking. Yeah. They flip the whole thing, and most of their ministry is talking about the day they got saved. Oh, yeah. I, I'm glad for the day I got saved. But if every church service I come in to talk about when I got saved, people are like, man, we're, we're all saved here. Let's talk about something else. When I married my wife 10 years ago, it was a wonderful day. And it was an exciting day. There were tears on that day. But if every single day for 10 years, every time me and Kristen got together on the car ride coming to church, I just said, oh, aren't you glad for the day? Aren't you glad for the day when we got married? That's an exciting day. But listen, if we don't talk about other things and all we ever talk about is cry about the day. Listen, I'm not diminishing the day we got saved. Maybe us as Christians ought to appreciate that day more. But we need to preach the whole counsel of God. We've got to right. preach the word. Right. We've got to have things be done decently and in order. The Bible says, covet to prophecy. Covet to prophesy. We should want to preach. We should look forward and have a hunger for the word of God. Yeah. Not bask in a worship experience. Uh, the other, one of the other key is... Uh, the uh, I'm sorry, let me, let, me, let me go back here. One of the things you'll see in a Pentecostal church that in, in Azusa Street... And you'll find it common now in Baptist churches is running the aisles. They called it the Jericho March. Uh, and it was spontaneous. The, church, the, the Holy Spirit took control of their emotions and they couldn't control themselves. Hey, listen, I've run aisles. And I can tell you every time I did, I knew exactly what I was doing. And I, listen, in a good heart, I just wanted to be a part of something big. You know, I wanted to be a part of it. It was exciting. You go to a football game, you're like, yeah, get them, rip their head off, kill them. You know, I, I have complete control of my emotions. And maybe every once in a while, it's okay to act crazy. But hey, acting crazy when someone points to that and says that's evidence of the Holy Ghost, eh, hold on, back it up. You want to act like a lunatic, that's fine. But say, hey, I was just having a good time. Don't point to it and say that was the Holy Ghost because you're pointing to something God never said. How does the Bible say how to have church? Nehemiah chapter 8, in verse 8, it says, So they read the book of the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. If you're not giving the sense and causing people to understand the reading, you didn't preach. So just because you got up there and took a verse and took a fit does not mean you gave the sense and gave uh, the word of God distinctly. That's how we ought to have our service. These things where the worship service or the singing takes control of the entire services and pushing, pushes the preaching outside the window, pushes the word of God outside the window, is the exact opposite of old time religion. Yeah. Look at you're reading Old Time Religion in Nehemiah chapter 8. Amen. It's an emphasis on the Word of God. Amen. Okay, nothing wrong with singing, nothing wrong with worship, but the emphasis should be placed on the Word of God. Right. Right. Verse 6 in Nehemiah 8 says, And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. You'll notice that uh, everybody said amen. Everybody worshipped. Everybody 
praise. And here's the thing. You'll notice that they bowed their face to the ground. The Bible says, 1 Corinthians 14, let your women keep silence in the churches. For it is not permitted for them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. If they'll learn anything, so during the preaching, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. So no, Baptists, they don't have women preachers, but you know what they do? They got testifiers, don't they? They got Sunday school teachers, don't they? And inherently, there's something disobedient inside a person that says, I know it says that, but I just think they should be able to testify. You'll notice that men, women, everybody said amen, everybody worship, everybody prays, and there's a difference between bowing your face to the ground, such as this, with your hands in the air, and one of these numbers. Or the dead man hang. <laughs> this glorifies me. It's egocentric, not theocentric. Yeah. It shows, hey, look at me, instead of taking the emphasis off God where it ought to be. Worship is everybody bowing their face. Genesis yeah. 24, 52. They worship the Lord bowing their face to the earth. David said to the congregation, now bless the Lord your God and all the congregation, the church, their fathers bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord, their king. So bow, uh, worship involves bowing. <clears throat> so how should we worship in church? Second Chronicles 29, look at verse 28. It says, and the congregation, that's the church, worshiped, and the singers sang, and the trumpeters sounded, and all this continued until the burnt offering was finished. Now, was the whole congregation the trumpeters? No. They had trumpeters. They had instrumentalists. Was the whole congregation the singers? No. They had singers. Did the whole congregation worship? Yes. The whole congregation worshiped together. It wasn't some rogue woman off in the corner saying, Come on! Preach it. Preach it. Everybody worship. This thing where it singles people out and there's one guy shouting in the corner and there's confusion. Everybody praying to you. And then some people are in their seat. Some people are praying together. Listen, hey, I, I don't even have a problem with special singing. I don't care that we don't have it, because I like him singing. But I don't have a problem with churches who do have it. My wife sings special music. Many people have come to my wife and said, hey, thanks, that was a blessing. I was discouraged. That helped encourage me. It put a song in my heart. We should sing to ourselves, speak to ourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. But here, here the thing. When it becomes all about look at me, and you're doing rolls with your voice, and it becomes all about doing runs on the keyboard or runs on the, on the guitar... Uh, Dustin did a special the other day on the guitar. I enjoyed it. You know, I guess if we call that a special. But it, was, uh, it wasn't about look at me, look at me. And a lot of times that's what it gets to. In John chapter 4 verse 24, it says, God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. So how are we supposed to worship God? Spirit and in truth. <laughs> Somebody just read it. Uh, John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. So how are you going to worship? According to the Word of God. It's real simple, right? Yeah. You do it apart from the Word of God, and you're out of line. It's a false balance. Matthew chapter 6, look at verse 5. It says, When thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogue and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, Christian, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut the door, pray to thy Father, which is in secret, and thy father which, is, which seeth thee in secret shall reward thee openly. Again, it goes back to we want to do exactly what God tells us not to do. The emphasis is put, hey, listen, when you pray, make sure you just go to your closet and shut the door. No, no, everybody come forward. Everybody pray in the front. It's like exactly what he tells us not to do. That's automatically what people want to do. True worshipers are going to worship people according to the Bible. If your worship's all about you, it's not worship. Yeah, that's right. It's not worship. Everything they did was giving glory back to God. It was right. all about him, not about them. They didn't care if they get seen. Yeah. They didn't cry because they didn't sing a special. You think those singers got all messed up because they didn't get called on to come up there? It was a part of the congregation. The church together did it. They just want to get a touch from God. A lot of the terminology gets vague. And I, I'm not trying to make fun of them, but I do need to say this because this is borrowed from Pen uh, Trust me, I did a lot of research. These terms, getting a touch from God, you know, getting us under the spout where the glory comes, all these things is Pentecostal terminology taken over by Baptists. Yeah. And now we're trying to merge the two together. Yeah. You know, a lot of these, uh, these altar calls, as well as the purpose of having a lapse, because Pentecostals believe they need to get saved over and over and over. Yeah. The Baptists believe you've got to constantly keep coming and get right with God. Hey, if this didn't prick your heart, come forward. Come forward. I wonder why some of you haven't come forward in a while. I check up and see if you got what we got. Yeah. Whoa. Whoa. Yeah. What happened to putting works to salvation? Right. We did the same thing the Pentecostals did, and we named it something different. That's right. Yeah, that's true. Uh, 
And then uh, I, I very rarely see people called to preach. I'm so glad Pastor Anderson did that thing about myths about being called to preach. Very rarely do I see that happen at a restaurant, in their home, at a football game. It always happens at an altar call. And they were moved because the emotion made you move forward. Do it without a piano. Do it without singing. Why has the call always have to happen when all that's going on? And they, they feel like someone's pressing their thumb on them, putting them through the earth. It used to be called the anxious seat or the mourner's bench, but it can't be found in the Bible. You know who popularized it? It's a Presbyterian, Charles Finney. Okay? You know why he got people to come forward? To sign them up during the abolition period for slavery. You know what he also did? He was able to see the fruit of his preaching, who was getting right. Guys, we say, well, we're not using it for that purpose. We just want people to get right with God. Then if we're not using it for that purpose, let's put a confessional box up here. Only we won't have the priest. You just go in the box and talk to God. But everybody sees you go in the box. Why have it? It's not scriptural. Why even have it? Why have the altars? <clears throat> so this and, and where it was first published, this altar call in the 1900s was through holiness churches, Pentecostal churches. It was giving false assurance to people. It was misleading people into false conversions where they're tracing their conversion back to, I'm just going to live a better Christian life, kind of like Alcoholics Anonymous. Even John Williamson Nevin, he wrote a book called The Anxious Bench, in which he said, spurious revivals are common, and as the fruit of them, false conversions lamentably abound. An anxious bench may be crowded where no divine influence whatever is felt. Hundreds may be carried through the process of the anxious bench conversion, and yet their last state may be worse than the first. You know what's worse than never getting saved? Thinking you did something to get saved and you never were saved. Right, yeah. And your whole life you're going through the, because it was an emotional decision. It makes me nervous. Can, I, can people get saved at the altar? Yes, of course they can. But to say, like, to keep pushing this thing about the altar call for salvation gives people a false assurance. So you want to see what the old time Baptist did? The old time Baptist showed up at these meetings. Oh yeah, when they have a revival meeting, you know who was there praying out loud for God to smite the leaders of the meeting and to stop this heresy immediately? The Baptist. Hey, you want old time religion? You want to be old fashioned? Our Baptist forefather showed up at these meetings and says, that's heresy, that's works, it's false conversion, it's leading people astray, God kill the leaders. I'm not saying, I mean, that's what they said. I didn't, I didn't do it. It's in, the, it's in this book. You can read up on Baptist history. They were disgusted with it. But the altar call originated with Pentecost, so it's not scriptural. 3,000 people were saved at Pentecost with not a single invitation. For sake of time, I'm just going to quickly go through this. Genesis 8. It said, they, Noah built an altar before the Lord and offered burnt offerings upon the altar. What's an altar for? Offering burnt on, uh, offerings. Yeah. Exodus 20, 24. An altar of earth thou shalt make unto me. So what should it be made out of? Earth or Exodus 20, 25. If thou wilt make an altar of stone, thou shalt not build it out of hewn stone. For if thou lift up thy tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. Make it out of earth. Make it out of rocks piled up. Don't lay a tool to it. Exodus 20, 26. Neither shalt thou go up by steps unto mine altar, that thy nakedness be not discovered thereon. No steps. And this ye have done again, covering the altar of the Lord with tears in Malachi 2, 13. With weeping and with crying out, insomuch that he regardeth not the offering anymore, or receiveth it with good will at your hand. Altars are for sacrifice. The sacrifice has already been made. We don't need an altar. If there's any reason to not have it, it's to show that Jesus paid it. He was the sacrifice. If, why don't we put a crucifix with Jesus Christ on it like the Catholics do? You'll see that altars are usually made up of wood. He said, build it out of earth and rocks. He said, don't put steps up at the altar. We made the steps the altar. He said, don't weep. Don't cry at the altar. Now we're going to put tissue boxes just in case there's some fun. Exactly what he said not to do, we do. Right. Guys, I'm not trying to pick here, but can you not see that in the heart of man is bent to rebel? Oh, God said that? I'm going to do the exact opposite. No women talking in church? What about this woman testify? Wait, no, no uh, tears at the altar? Oh, let's put tissue boxes up here. Come on, guys. Let's, let's be according to the Bible. Another thing is getting drunk on the Holy Ghost. Okay, you've heard that? I've actually heard a preacher. He was, he was walking across the pews. He's almost 80 years old. Someone goes to help him because he's 80. And, and they're saying, hey, you know, I'm trying to help him from falling. He said, don't touch me. I can't fall while I'm in the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost does not make you leap tall buildings in a single bound. Let's look in the Bible and see what being filled with the Holy Ghost is. And I want you to turn here. 
Ephesians chapter 5. Turn there. And with the other hand, I want you to get Colossians 3.16. I really want you to see this part. While you're turning there, Exodus 31.3, it says, I filled them with the Spirit of God in wisdom, understanding, and in knowledge. Exodus 35.31, and he have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, and in knowledge. 1 Corinthians 12.7, but to the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. So what is being filled with the Spirit associated with? Wisdom, knowledge, understanding. Do you see anything in that about being drunk? It's the exact opposite, being sober. How do you get your wisdom, your knowledge, and your understanding? I'll show you where you get it. Look at um, Ephesians chapter 5, look at verse 18. And be not drunk with wine. So how could it, how could it mean you being drunk and acting, staggering around and, mu and mumbling? It says, be not drunk with wine. We're in a success, but be filled with the Spirit. The opposite of being drunk with wine. Speaking to yourself, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now look at Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. See how it's substituted being filled with the Spirit with let the word of Christ dwell in you richly? Yeah. <clears throat> with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. So what is being filled with the Spirit? Being filled with the word of Christ. Yes, Real right. easy according to the Bible. Good. You can't be filled with the Spirit of God without being filled with the word of God. If you don't read your Bible, you're not full of the Holy Ghost. If you never meditate on his precepts, you're not filled with the Holy Ghost. If you've never even soul with, if you've never won one person to the Lord and used the Bible verse one time in your life, how can you be filled with the Spirit of God? How about that? It doesn't make you Superman. It's not about getting a buzz or acting drunk in church. It's about being filled with the Word of God. Yeah. John 14, 26, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I've said unto you. How can he bring something to your remembrance you've never read? How in the world? If being filled with the Holy Ghost is him bringing to remembrance, and this is, this is what the Comforter is going to teach you, you must be full with the Word of God. You must have the Word of God let, uh, dwelling in you richly. I've heard a preacher, he stood up and he said, God bear me witness in the Holy Ghost, which is swearing to God, which is problem number one. God told me louder than audible, some of you men need to go to Bible college. No, God didn't tell them that. The Bible college is liberal. It teaches false doctrine. There's no way he told you that. I've got a Bible that says you should have had a desire, met the qualifications, and if you were found favorable and faithful, your preacher would have sent you out, yes, and then you would have started a church that way. Not gone to a liberal Bible college to get corrupt doctrine. God didn't tell you to go there. I call baloney. John 16, 13. How be it he, the spirit of truth has come. He will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he'll show you things to come. He shall glorify me. The Holy Spirit does not seek to make us spirit conscious. He seeks to make us Christ conscious. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The, Jesus Christ is the Word. He always points to Jesus Christ. That's a Pentecostal teaching. That's why you see such effeminacy in the, in the Pentecostal church, because it's all about spirit. It's about feeling, feeling, feeling. But He always points to the Word of God. He will not speak to you apart from the Bible. Isaiah 8, 20, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. Look at our hymns. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he hath said? You unto Jesus for refuge have fled. They're not satisfied with what's written. I got to have something more. Because it makes that guy look super spiritual when he's just been waiting on God the whole service and say, God just told me, Sister so and so, stand up and testify. And Sister so and so rebukes all the men in the church. He goes, Sister so and so, go ahead and sit back down. Maybe, maybe God didn't tell me that at all. That's, that's what happens. Real quick, rapid fire verses. So, what is it? All right, Jeremy, you said it's not a feeling, it's not a buzz, it's not all the commotion, it's not putting holes in the wall. It's not chucking hymnals or jumping in a baptistry. Yeah. Or I've literally seen people go run to the bathroom, grab toilet paper, and throw toilet paper across. Their... Guys, I've been there. My, uh, my uncle's mother, who was 94, was in that service and got gashed across the head, bleeding from her forehead for toilet paper. Don't tell me you were full of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Unless God was just really picking on the poor old woman. <laughs> Acts 1.8. Here's how you get evidence of the Holy Ghost. But you shall receive power. After the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you shall be witnesses unto me. The Holy Ghost is going to make you a bold witness. Acts 19, 17, being filled with the, 
uh, being filled with the Holy Ghost, Paul, uh, verse 20 says, straightway preached Christ in the synagogue. So what does being filled with the Holy Ghost make you? A preacher. Yeah. You're going to go and preach Christ. When, uh, Acts 11, when the tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church, was at Jerusalem, they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch, who when he was come, had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all. Verse 24, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people were added to the Lord. What did he do? He exhorted Christ to them, and people got saved. I want to say these guys who were running laps to open the side door and say, keep going. Tell them all. Tell them. So it's going to give you boldness. The Holy Ghost witnessed to every city, saying that the bonds afflicted me. We're going to skip down uh, 1 Peter 1, 12. It says, which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost. Listen, if you're going to preach, it's going to have to be with the Holy Ghost. I had 17 verses that says being filled with the Holy Ghost is being filled with the Word of God. Uh, Mark 12, 24. We're going to wrap this up. And Jesus answering, said unto them, Do you therefore err because ye know not the Scriptures, neither the power of God? Don't tell me you have the power of God when you erred according to the Scriptures. You were wrong in the first place. Here's your old time church. You know what it was like? I'll give you a reading out of a 1600s Baptist church. Tell me where all this Bapticostalism is. In order of the worship and government of our church is one, we begin with prayer. After some one or two chapters of the Bible, we give the sense thereof, confer upon the same. That done, we lay aside our books. And after a solemn prayer made by the speaker, he propoundeth some out of the scripture and prophesieth out of the same by the space of one hour and three quarters of an hour. To summarize, the old time way or old time religion promotes soul winning and the Bible. Bapticostals promote having a good time. Let's be educated. Let's not err according to the scriptures. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the time. Lord, thank you for the study that went into this. Lord, how you've helped me and answered many, many questions I've had. Lord, because I didn't know, but I'm thankful that I have a Bible and I have a place where I can get the answers. I pray this would be a help to somebody and that maybe you'd speak to somebody's heart. In Jesus' name, I thank you. Amen. Amen.